This evening, we consider the topic, the first of all commandments, the first of all commandments. You know, children who are raised in Christian homes and who go to church, they will usually answer yes when they're asked if they love God. They're conditioned to say this. And of course, as parents, we hope that, and we do pray that they mean what they say from the hearts. Now, similarly, when we as believers are asked if we love God, being older, having experienced the Christian faith and life and going through temptations, we also say yes, but we admit that we don't love him enough. You know, when the Apostle Peter was asked by Jesus, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And here, Jesus, when he asked the question, he used the highest form of the word love, which is agape, a selfless love. So essentially, he was asking Peter, you know, do you love me sacrificially? Love me selflessly? And how did Peter reply? He said, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. But Peter used a lower form of the word love. He did not use agape. He used phileo. In other words, he was saying, Lord, you know how fond I am of you. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus was asking. Jesus was asking, do you love me selflessly, sacrificially? Uh, you know I'm fond of you, Lord. Now, why did Peter say this? Why do we sometimes say this? This is frequently our response because we know that our love for God is imperfect. We often fail to love. We know that he loves us, but we struggle to love him back in the same way. That's why if we are the sons and daughters of Christ, of God through Christ, then let us strive to hate sin, to put to death sin, as we saw last week. But instead, we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So today, we want to see how we should love God. And here, we're told that the first of all commandments, the most important commandment, is to love God. Now, when the scribe asked Jesus which commandment was most important, the Lord said the first of all the commandments, not the first commandment, but the most important, the primary commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So this evening, I'll expound from this passage in two points. Firstly, love God by obeying Him. Love God by obeying Him. And secondly, love God by surrendering to and trusting Him. Love God by surrendering to and trusting Him. So firstly, love God by obeying Him. Now, the background of this encounter was Jesus was answering some questions posed to him by the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. If you turn and you look at verse 13, they were actually trying to catch him in his words. So they asked him very complex questions, hoping to trap him and to get him into trouble. Uh, if you remember, they talked about paying taxes they asked him about that, about that. They also asked him about the resurrection. And Jesus so masterfully answered all of these questions that one of these scribes was duly impressed, and he was moved, and that's why he asked this important question of Jesus, which is the first commandment of all, which is the most important commandment. Now, in a parallel passage in Matthew 22, verse 35, this scribe, or it uses the word lawyer there, he asked this question to test Jesus. I don't think it, is, it was done in a malicious way to trick Jesus, as was what was done previously, but he asked this question genuinely because he wanted to 
ascertain what did this wise master, what did this person who answered so well, how will he answer this most important question? You see, this was a question that consumed the mind of the Pharisee. And this man was a special kind of Pharisee. He wasn't just the run-of-the-mill Pharisee. He was a scribe. He was a lawyer. You could say he was the full-time Pharisee. His job was to study the law. And at times, it was to transcribe it, to copy it, write commentaries on it. And on occasion, he would be uh, called upon to uh, interpret certain legal points and also to draft out certain legal documents. That's why he was called a lawyer. And this was a question that was very vital to him. It was something that consumed the minds of all of the various uh, scribes and lawyers and Pharisees. And the question also shows us how fixated on the law the Pharisees were, more fixated than on God. They were more concerned about the letter of the law. And so therefore, their starting point was skewed. And what we see here is their idolatry of the law. Now, if you search the books of Moses from Genesis to Deuteronomy, you would find a total of 613 laws that are articulated. Uh, these were given to the Israelites to obey. 248 of them are positive commandments. In other words, what God commands you to do. And uh, 365 of them were negative commandments, what God forbids them to do. And these 613 laws are an expansion, sometimes a practical expansion of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. So as we said earlier on, they relate to the object of worship, the manner of worship, the reputation of the God that we worship, the day of worship. They also relate to our duties to rulers, to life, to relationships and marriages, to vocations, and also to the truth and blessings that God has given to us. Now, to these scribes, 613 laws, an expansion of the Ten Commandments, they were wondering, what is the most important I mean, surely, God, you can't expect us to keep all 613 of them. Or if you do, what's the most important of them all? And so they spent a lot of time thinking about that. And they also had their own way of grading the laws. Some laws were more important than others. And for those very important laws, they invented regulations to ensure that those laws wouldn't be broken. For example, in order not to sin by your walking during the Sabbath, the rabbis in those days, they limited your walking to 2,000 cubits. So you can walk 2,000 cubits of a radius out of your house. Any more than that, uh, you're considered to have sin. And that's why in Luke 11:46, Jesus accused the Pharisees of laying such burdens on men that were too grievous to be born. I mean, the Bible never says you can not walk more than 2,000 cubits, but it was the rabbis who, in grading the laws, in fixating on the laws, were coming up with new laws in order to protect the laws of God. But what is ironic is this. Despite this idea of wanting to keep the laws, they also tried to find ways around the laws. So, like I said, the rabbis have said, you can't walk 2,000 uh, cubits beyond your house. But the Pharisees found a way to extend the borders of the house. They would tie fishing line from the house around the town, around the city, even longer. So, as long as you walked within those lines, and not 5, 000, more than 5,000 uh, cube, uh, 2,000 cubits beyond those lines, you're fine. So if you live in New York City, a big, huge city, the fishing line surrounds New York City, you can happily walk around that town without breaking the law in their mind. So this really tells us that 
they were not so much interested in pleasing God. They were more interested in keeping the regulations and finding ways around the regulations, still trying to keep within the regulations. So these made it so that they could quote unquote keep God's law to their convenience. But such obedience is not genuine. It does not involve the heart. Because in the end, God is the one who had given the Sabbath commandment to rest from all our labors, to focus on Him, to think about our love for Him. And these regulations only made the law harder to obey. Now you have to spend the whole day mentally thinking, am I breaking, am I not breaking? because you're fixated on the law rather than on loving God, all right? And not the law of God, but the man-made law. And question and answer 95, as we read, reveals that this is idolatry. It is having or inventing something in which to put our trust instead of or in addition to the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. You see, the purpose of keeping the law their way for them was to say, I've kept it. I've not transgressed. God can't accuse me of not keeping his law. You see, God must say, I'm now very obedient. So it was not God they they were trying to please. It was themselves. And, And this is why the Pharisees in Jesus' parable in Luke 18 was able to say, You remember that? Jesus told a parable of a publican and a Pharisee who went to the temple. The Pharisee said to God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. You see, God, you can't accuse me. I'm doing well. So this was the Pharisee's idolatry of the law. It was an idolatry of man and his ability. So what was Jesus' answer to this man, all right, the one who asked the question? Basically said there isn't one law that is more important than another. All commandments are important, but the foundation of the commandments is love. If you miss that, the law becomes an idol. So Jesus took these 613 regulations, which are summarized in the Ten Commandments, and he further summarized them into two great commandments, love God and love man. Verses 29 to 31, Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like unto this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now in the parallel passage, Matthew 11, or Matthew 22, rather, uh, Jesus said that on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So 613 is summarized to 10, is further summarized into these two commandments, how we please God and how we please God by loving others. Now, question and answer 93 we also see this, that these commandments are divided into two parts. The first teaches us how to live in relation to God. The second, what duties we owe our neighbor. And so this scribe, he had to relearn, right, that love for God is the very thing that underpins these commandments. So what's the essence of keeping the law? Why do you keep the law as believers? Is it so that you can say, well, I'm a Christian. I just have to keep these laws so that God will be pleased at me, so that others who look at me in the church can say, wow, that's a very good Christian. Is that the reason why? No, the reason why we keep the laws is because we love God. 
It is not to congratulate ourselves that we've been obedient, that we have done so well, that we've not managed to break the law, but it is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, when when God gave the law to the people in Mount Sinai, He made this connection between obedience and love. You know, for some of us, even as Christians, we may sit here and say, I don't like the sound of this. Are you telling me that if I don't obey God, I don't love Him? Yes, that is what I'm saying, because that is what the Bible says. When God gave the second commandment in Exodus 20, verse 6, when he told the people not to make any graven image or bow down uh, to them, and we can look at it right here, right? In commandment number four, or rather commandment number two, where it says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. All right? So if they did not make idols, if they worshiped God in the manner in which he prescribed, if they were not doing their own will, it shows that they love God. Another time in Deuteronomy 5, when the law was given a second time, this was reiterated in verse 10, where God would show mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. How do you love God? When do you love God? When you keep his commandments. Even our Lord Jesus said that in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's not the only instance. In 2 John, verse 6, it says, and this is love. So the apostle John is saying, you want to know what love is? This is love. In the dictionary, if you open it, love, according to the Bible, is that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. What is love? Obey God. Also, we're told in John 15, 10, that if we keep his commandments, we abide in his love. Jesus says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. Dearly beloved, does God love all of his children? Yes. But does he love those more who obey him? Yes, he does. This is what we see from the scriptures. So to love God means to obey God, and the one who obeys God will be loved by God. And the final verse for you, John 14, 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, dearly beloved, this was such an important teaching to the scribe because the scribe had this idolatry of the law. He obeyed the law to gain righteousness, and he taught certain ways to maintain righteousness even while circumventing the law. And when it comes down to it, that is not love. That is not devotion because the law has to do with love. Now, even the Greek word love, Agape, it gives this impression. It is a sacrificial, selfless love that acts, that does. Jesus did not use the word eros, which talks about sexual lust, nor the word storge, like a you know, lust, a love for things. I want the new iPhone 15. That's a love for things. He didn't even use the word phileo, which means a love for 
for your friends, a fondness for your friends, but he used the word agape, which speaks of a generous, unending, consuming love that acts. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that is why the word in our grand old translation is often translated as charity. So it's not a sexual, selfish love, right? Not a, just an affectionate love, but it is an active, sacrificial love that gives. God demonstrates his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is an active love. And so if we are to love God, we must actively keep his commandments. It must be shown in our actions. You know, in Ephesians 5.25, where Paul instructed husbands, he says, husbands, love your wives. How? As Christ did, love the church and gave himself for the church. He died for his church. And so husbands, your love must be to the extent where you die for your wife. That's a kind of active love. And, and therefore, that's the kind of love that must fuel our obedience to God. And as we come this evening to hear about the law of God, we can never divorce it from love. And if we are to love God, obedience to his laws must be paramount in our desire. That must be our paramount desire. So this leads us to the second point. Love God by surrendering to and trusting Him. You see, when it comes down to it, none of us here can perfectly obey God. Our love so often is so weak that we, along with Peter, dare not say that, yes, Lord, I will love you sacrificially. Some of us can only muster up a, you know, Lord, how fond I am of you. We're weak, and that is why we can never keep the commandments perfectly. We can never hope to obey, to obey him out of love unless we surrender and trust in him. Now, remember the preface of the Ten Commandments. You know, even Jesus said it, I'm the Lord your God who hath delivered you. And we even see it, you know, in question and answer 92, God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. He is your God. He is your deliverer. You see, we are not obeying some tyrant. We're obeying the Lord. He's the one who delivers. You know, he is the covenant-keeping God. When Israel was oppressed by Egypt, when they cried out to God, God was the one who heard their cries. That's what he told Moses. I have heard the cries of my people. And his name is Jehovah. He is the Lord, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come. He is the one who never changes. And we see here that he is your God. He is the only true and living God. You know, God has condescended to be your God. He didn't have to be your God, but he condescended to have a relationship with you. He didn't, need to have, he didn't need to even be anyone's God. But he is God, and he has come to deliver you from your sins. And, and that is why our catechism in question and answer 94, it says that for the sake of my very salvation, I avoid and flee all idolatry, witchcraft, superstition, and prayers to the saints and to other creatures, further that I rightly come to know the only true God, trust in Him alone, submit, surrender to Him with all humility and patience, expect all good from Him only, and love, fear, and honor Him with all my heart, 
In short, that I forsake all creatures rather than do the least thing against his will. So that is the preface because of who God is, that he is the only living and true God, the deliverer, because God has so lovingly delivered us. That is why we obey. We flee idolatry. We come to him, submit and trust and love him and honor him. Now, notice the beauty of this phrase that Jesus said, that thou shalt love thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, our obedience, first and foremost, is not to the preacher, right? It is not to the commandments of the church elders. It is not, firstly, to the civil government. Yes, when we look at the fifth commandment, it has much to say about this, but firstly, first and foremostly, we obey God rather than man, and the motivation is out of love. And why would we not obey God rather than man? You know, God is far different from man. There's a graciousness in God that does not exist in man. You know, when David sinned against God. God told him, you got two choices. You can face the consequences of my judgment and I will judge the land, or you can let your enemies conquer you. Which one do you want? David said, I'll let you judge because God is far more gracious than man. God is a gentle taskmaster. That's why we take his yoke upon us, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Yes, the Lord is great, but he humbles himself. He is concerned even for the affairs of the sparrow. Psalm 113, verses 4 to 7, they read, The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, but who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust. He lifteth up the needy out of the dunghill. So God is not like some proud preacher, pastor, some tyrannical elder, you know, some king who is oppressive. You know, those are all small men who think highly of themselves, but God is high, but he condescends to be with us. That is why we can surrender to him. That is why we can trust him. That is why we can love him, and that is why we can obey him. And we learn the marvelous thing about this God, love the Lord thy God, you know, is that this God does not wait for man to love him first before he initiates loving. In fact, we're told, even in the Ten Commandments, that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I delivered you first. And after delivering you, that's when I'm giving you these commandments. You don't obey the commandments so that I will deliver you, but I have delivered you. That is why you obey the commandments. You are saved to obey You're redeemed to give your obedience to God. And that is why love is the motivation because we're told, 1 John 4, 10, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. See, God so loved, he so rescued us by sending Jesus to be a sacrifice. Jesus so loved the church that he gave himself for the church It was there in the Garden of Gethsemane that he loved us so much and he loved God so much that he said, you know, God, I don't want to die. Let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but thine be done. Our Lord Jesus shows that in love he surrendered himself and he obeyed the Father. He trusted in the will and the providence of the Father whom he loved. And that is why, dearly beloved, if we know who the Savior is, if we know who this God is, that his burdens are not heavy, that his yoke is easy, 
If we know that he is a deliverer, and he tenderly comes to us and has rescued us from sin, from the slavery of sin, then we love Christ by obeying him, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is surrender. Now, dearly beloved, as Christians, we struggle with obedience, don't we? Why? Because we love our sins. We want to be the masters of our own life. We want to look at the commandments and say, and manipulate them, and to say we have kept them, but we have not kept it in heart. That is idolatry of self. That is forbidden in the first commandment. So we need to love him by surrendering to him and trusting him wholly. And how we do that is by our whole faculties, by obeying him and all his commandments with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this includes the whole being, not just the doing, not just the Pharisees who could argue themselves out of obeying God from the heart. You see, the heart here, with all thy heart, refers to sincerity and honesty. So our love for God must be genuine. Our obedience must not be out of pretense. The word soul refers to devotion. We're to love God devotionally with much affection, our obedience must be done out of deep gratitude. The word mind here refers to a conscious acknowledgement of who he is, that he is the living and the true God. He is mighty and he demands our entire being and he deserves it. So we are to love God with intellectual assent, agreeing consciously that he must be loved our obedience must be done voluntarily with the will, with all the will, and also with all the strength, with all effort. And so this really tells us that our obedience is not dependent on our natural feelings, but we need to stir our feelings to know who he is and therefore love him and obey him out of a renewed will. So we're reminded here in all of our faculties that we are to do it to the maximum, 100%. We're reminded to love with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind, and all our strength. And we can never do this unless God is all to us. The wonderful thing about this passage is this. After hearing this, the scribe understood Loving God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength, along with loving one's neighbors, is far more than all the works of the hands, all the burnt offerings, all the sacrifices that one can perform, because it includes the greatest sacrifice of all that one can give to God, and that is a sacrifice of the whole being you see, this Pharisee, this scribe, was fixated in the past with the idolatry of the law. What he could do, how he could get around it, you know, even all the offerings that he could offer God, and I've done all my tithes and all my sacrifices, keeping all the regulations. Oh, I've done myself good. That was idolatry of himself. It was not worshiping the true God. You see, God does not want our obedience if it does not include our whole selves. And that's what the scribe says. It is far more than all burnt offerings. In Psalm 51, 16 to 17, David says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. It is coming to God and saying, I love you, I want to obey you, and I can't in my own strength. Here's my broken heart and inability. All of my unacceptable works, O oh Lord, I lay at your feet. And that is what God receives. It is a heart of humility, knowing that we can't do anything apart from God. 
But the wonderful thing is when we have this attitude in coming to God, in striving, in keeping His commandments out of love, we are told in Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So as unable as we are, as much as we do not love God enough, but when we come to Him offering our whole selves, the Lord will help us obey Him. Now, after Jesus said all of this, the scribe replied wisely, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. So he acknowledged, For there is one God, there is none other but He, and to love Him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love His neighbor as Himself is more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So at this moment, the scribe realized the idolatry of his own heart, that he had focused on the laws rather than God. And here, he acknowledged the first commandment, for there is one God, and there is none other but He. And so he admitted his own idolatry. And this is remarkable. This is where Jesus said, because he had heard this gospel truth, who God was, and Jesus said, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And the reason why Jesus said this is because he understood his idolatry, and now he understood why he should obey. So dearly beloved, what can we take from this? What application can we draw from this? We are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. How? Through our obedience. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. Before no idol bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor dare the Sabbath day profane. Give both thy parents honor due. Take heed that thou no murder do. Abstain from thoughts, words, deeds unclean, nor steal, though thou art poor and lean. And do not lie, but always say what is true, and covet not the things that don't belong to you. Let us pray. Our eternal and gracious Father, and we thank you that you are our Father, a loving God that has rescued us from our sins by giving the Lord Jesus, your only begotten Son, to remove your anger because of his sacrifice and how we're invited to be part of your family. And we thank you for these laws, these things that you command these wonderful truths that we can keep and ought to keep because we are your children. Help us to examine our own lives and to see where we have erred, in which areas we have not loved you enough. And yes, Lord, we echo with Peter that we are fond of you, but we desire so much to affirm that we love you sacrificially and selflessly. Help us, O oh Lord, in the coming week as we serve you in the world to be children of yours who show forth our salvation by our good works. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.